1994, James Robinson, fresh off a glowing success known as the Golden Age, a reinterpretation of the final days of the Justice Society of America, set about revamping one of DC's Golden Age heroes, Starman. Starman was the alias of Ted Knight, who fought crime throughout the 1940s, primarily using a special energy-generating rod, originally called a gravity rod, but later dubbed a cosmic rod. The rod allowed for Knight to fly and manipulate energy, which resulted in the ability to project a force blast. Knight was a member of both the JSA and the All-Star Squadron until he married and had two sons, David and Jack. There would be more than a few other incarnations of Starman throughout the following years, a couple of which we'll touch on later. That is, until the 1990s, when Ted's son David took up the mantle. Now, when Robinson pitched his ideas for Starman, it wouldn't actually involve David Knight. Instead, it would tell the story of David's younger brother, Jack. Robinson and artist Tony Harris would begin a run that would be held up alongside other character revamps like Alan Moore's Swamp Thing and Frank Miller's Daredevil. The run would be collected in six omnibus editions, the first of which is the volume we're looking at today. This is the Starman Omnibus, Volume 1. David Knight argues with his brother Jack as the former prepares to go out on patrol. David has looked down on Jack's decision to forgo the family business and instead pursue a job opening up an antique and curio shop. Jack is upset at David for constantly mocking what he does for a living. David and Jack's father Ted intercedes as he finishes walking on a new cosmic rod for David. The argument comes to a screeching halt when Jack mocks the Starman outfit which upsets Ted. Who kicks Jack out? Jack tries to smooth things over with his father and wishes David good luck, but David just flies off. David surveys his hometown of Opal City and takes off to resume patrol. It's then that David is struck by a sniper's bullet and falls to his death. Meanwhile, Jack has returned to his shop, nights past. Not too long after returning, he gets a call from his father, who's just received the news about David's death. Ted tells Jack that there's a spare cosmic rod the old cosmic belt of the hero the Star-Spangled Kid, and instructions on how to use both of them stored at Jack's shop. When Jack asks why, Ted says that he thinks someone is trying to come after him, Ted, through Jack and David. Ted then prepares to head down to the morgue to recover David's body and learn more about what happened, and it's just then that as he enters his car, the night mansion explodes and Ted is knocked out by a piece of flying debris. Meanwhile, Jack receives a visit from a strange man with a unique item. The gun that killed Starman. Jack tries to run from the man who shoots Jack in the leg, but Jack manages to locate the spare cosmic rod. Unfortunately, the man gets his hands on the star-spangled kid's belt. He then leaves with it tossing a hand grenade, and Jack uses the rod to escape the building just before it explodes. Jack tries contacting his father, only to find out about the explosion and Ted being taken to the hospital. Jack struggles as he tries to get to the hospital. He doesn't know what to do. David was Starman. Not him. Elsewhere, the man from before, whose name is Kyle, reports back to his father that both Knight boys are dead. Kyle's sister, whose name Nash, is worried, though, as Ted Knight is still alive. Their father assures them, though, this is all just one part of the Mist's plan. Now, the Mist was a Canadian World War I veteran who developed a chemical that allowed him to become gaseous. Initially, the Mist was an arch foe of Wesley Dodds, who was the original Sandman though he would eventually move on to further encounters with Starman, Ted Knight. Jack makes it to the hospital, where he's patched up and reunited with Ted. The two Knights are watched over by the O'Dare family, a police family that Ted was close friends with. Jack tries to explain to his father what happened with the cosmic belt, but Ted already knows, as Kyle has been seen on TV wreaking havoc. Ted's not surprised. Jack never aspired to be Starman, so why would Ted expect him to have even the littlest bit of success? It's then that they receive a call from the Mist, the villain gloats as he's already taken Ted Knight's legacy. He still thinks Jack is dead. And now he plans to take on the legacy of Ted's wife. Ted and Jack are left confused. Adele Knight died years ago and her body was cremated. Ted tells Jack to leave Opal City and return when things have settled down. Jack wants to only protect Ted. But Ted says that he's had enough protection from the O'Dares. So Jack leaves. While he waits at a bus terminal, Jack overhears about a report of an explosion at the Opal Art Museum. It's then that Jack realizes that his mother donated a large amount of money to the museum and has a wing named after her. This spurs Jack into action. He activates the cosmic rod and flies off to the museum. He begins using some old judo training he took when he was a child to take on a few masked thugs. 
This is witnessed by several members of the public, all of whom think Starman has returned, and one of whom has taken a particular interest. It's then that Kyles appears and begins shooting at Jack once more. Jack tries to flee, only to have the cosmic rod get struck by several of Kyle's gunshots. The rod snaps in half, and Jack plunges into the Opal River. Meanwhile, back at the museum, a couple of looters bump into the man from before who is so interested in Jack. The two tell the guy to back off, but they will soon learn what happens to those who antagonize the Shade. Richard Swift was an English gentleman who was caught in a mystical incident that killed 104 people. Since that point, Swift has been an ageless immortal who can wield a demonic portal called the Darklands. Taking inspiration from Dante's Inferno, Swift christened himself the Shade, and he would go on various adventures as a thief and anti-hero. Along the way, he would even befriend the likes of both Charles Dickens and Oscar Wilde. Jack quietly makes his way back to his apartment, where he begins to assemble a costume consisting of a leather jacket with a large astrological sign on the back, a tin badge from a box of Cracker Jacks, and a sled of flare goggles to protect him from the Cosmic Rod's brightness. As he exits, Jack gets jumped by several of the Mist's goons. Jack manages to hold him off, that is until Nash, the Mist's daughter, trains a gun on him. He asks why it is that she wants to kill him, and she freezes. Finally, Nash lowers the gun and tells Jack to leave. Jack makes his way back to the hospital, where Ted informs him of the location of a storage locker where he can find a new cosmic rod, along with a few other things. After Jack leaves, the shade materializes outside the hospital room and knocks out the O'Dares. Jack collects what he needs from the storage locker, opining that the new cosmic rod actually feels right for his hands, and returns to the hospital to find his father missing. It's then that Jack receives a call from the mist. The Mist tells Jack that if he ever wants to see Ted alive again, he'll have to beat Kyle in a duel. As Jack leaves to prepare to face Kyle one last time, the Shade pays a visit to the O'Dares. He tips the police family off to the Mist's location, and when asked why, the Shade responds that he kidnapped Ted Knight to gain the Mist's confidence. In reality, he's always had a fondness for Opal City and doesn't really approve of the Mist's tactics. The O'Dares forces begin to gather around the crypt in the Opal Creek Cemetery while Jack begins to fight Kyle. Kyle manages to counter almost all of Jack's attacks, but Jack begins to remember his past with David. He remembers how much the two used to fight with each other, with David consistently smashing and breaking Jack's things. But at the end of the day, they were still brothers. Jack manages to rally back, eventually incinerating Kyle with a blast from the cosmic rod. Afterwards, Jack vows never to kill again. Jack is reunited with Ted at the Mist's hideout, and the Mist is under arrest, still operating under the belief that Kyle is still fighting Jack. Nash, on the other hand, is livid. She showed Jack mercy. Mercy Jack did not extend to Kyle. Nash vows to return, and Jack notes that she suddenly lost her stutter. Afterwards, Ted and Jack talk. Jack says he'll only continue the heroics on the condition that he gets to live his life. No more nightly patrols to take on muggers. The Opal City Complete can handle that. Starman will only appear if the situation necessitates it. Ted agrees and tries to talk Jack into wearing the costume. Jack says no. Now, it's at this point that we're introduced to two other individuals who were once called Starman. The first is Michael Tomas, an alien originally sent to conquer Earth, but grew to love the planet and decided to defend it instead. Michael gained his powers from a sonic crystal embedded in his chest. This book shows Michael working in a circus sideshow, being chained up. And, for the record, yes, Michael is based on the David Bowie song Starman. The second Starman we'll see is named Will Payton, Will acquired his superpowers from a space satellite energy blast and fought evil briefly in the 1980s until apparently being killed in a battle with a villain known as Eclipso. However, now Will is being shown as a hostage in some sort of futuristic laboratory. Also, for the record, I am aware that there have been several other individuals who have called themselves Starman, but they don't appear in this volume, so we're not going to talk about them after this. Jack slowly inspects his father's newly designed cosmic rod when he's surprised by a visit of the Shade. However, the immortal has come under the auspices of peace. He gives Jack something he scavenged from the wreckage of the museum, the plaque dedicating the wing to Jack's mother. Shade also gives Jack a journal that he had been keeping for the past century and a half. He asks Jack to read the journal and thanks for the plaque, and then vanishes. Jack then goes about the rest of his day, where he begins trying to restock the items for his shop's reopening. When he comes back home, another man appears. This man is a buyer for a reclusive billionaire named Albert Becker. Mr. Becker is after a particularly kind of Hawaiian shirt. The shirt was designed by the Grand Master of Hawaiian shirt designers, Harry Ajax. 
It's said that the shirt was IX's masterpiece, and he disappeared not too long after designing it. Rumor has it that the shirt's pattern is actually a gateway to heaven. Thoroughly disturbed by the story, Jack takes the buyer's first offer, but the buyer will have to search for the shirt himself, as Jack doesn't even want to lay an eye on it. Later, Jack calls his father to relate the two stories of his day, the shade and the shirt. Ted tells Jack that this is all part of just being a hero. You don't find the weirdos. They find you. As for Albert Becker, he was left marveling over his recently purchased Hawaiian shirt, and then Mr. Becker mysteriously disappeared and was never heard from again. While Jack slept, he was visited in his dreams by his brother David. The two began fighting until they realized that they destroyed the graveyard in which they were standing. The two then set about repairing the damage, and Jack got to apologize to David for how he treated his brother in life. David admits that he always envied Jack for actually living his own life and not trying to live up to the legacy of Starman. As David starts to walk away, Jack pursues him. Jack says the two have still things to confront. But David says not to worry. He'll be back in a year, and then vanishes. Jack then began reading the Shade's journal. He happened on a story from a visit to Opal City in 1882. The Shade was meeting with a trusted friend, Oscar Wilde, for lunch. Wilde wished to know more about the Shade's past, in particular anything relating to more immortality. The Shade had been very wary of sharing too much of his history with friends. Charles Dickens had been inspired by the Shade to write The Old Curiosity Shop. It's then that Wilde relates an encounter he had with another immortal being, one whose depravity had a deep effect on the playwright. Before Wilde can elaborate, the two men are approached by a young man named Jason Mayville. Jason wishes to procure the Shade's services. Jason and his sister Annette have come into an inheritance, except Annette has been wooed by a traveling hypnotist named Loon. Certain that Loon is about to coerce Annette into signing over half of the family fortune, Jason needs the Shade to scare Loon off. Shade is willing to take the job for a certain price, which Jason readily agrees to. That night, the Shade has visited the backstage of Loon's traveling stage troupe. Using his abilities, the Shade makes his way to Loon's dressing room. The hypnotist is... playing with an obviously brainwashed Annette. Shade tries to scare him by threatening to go to the police. However, Loon won't let the Shade go, as he's promised to share his new fortune with the rest of the troop. However, they have underestimated the Shade, who unleashes a horde of demonic creatures who make quick work of the performers, and then Shade turns his focus to Loon. Loon tries to flee up into the rafters of the playhouse, only to end up falling to his death. The next day, Jason Mayville delivers his payment to the Shade, one rose, along with 10% of the Mayville fortune which, compared to the 50% he was about to lose, did seem fair. It's then that the Shade turns to Wilde and asks for more information on this newfound immortal. And that's where the story ends, as the next page of the journal has been ripped out. Jack returned to trying to restock inventory for his shop, deciding to hit up a small circus outside of Opal City for promotional material. Before meeting with the circus showner, one Mr. Bliss, Jack makes his way through the sideshow and happens across an exhibit labeled The Cosmic Geek. Upon entering the tent, he finds Michael Tomas. Michael reaches out and briefly touches Jack, which causes Jack to receive a psychic vision of Michael's life. Jack exits the tent and talks with Bliss. Bliss allows Jack to look through some old boxes of material. Jack then inquires about Michael. Bliss answers that the Cosmic Geek is really a blue-painted performer named Greg Bailey, and even lets Jack talk with the other sideshow acts to find out more. However, within a few minutes of Jack showing up, the other performers attack him, quickly overwhelming Jack and throwing him out into a nearby field where he passes out. When he comes to, Jack returns to Opal City and picks up his Starman gear. He then goes back to the circus, where the sideshow performers jump him again, except this time it's a gesture of peace. The performers tell Jack that Bliss is really an incubus that feeds on emotion, and he's holding them hostage. Bliss is currently asleep, so his hold over the performers is very weak. Once he wakes up, though, Jack will once again be at a disadvantage. Jack challenges Bliss, and though the fight doesn't bode well for Jack, until Michael begins to watch and slowly starts to feel inspired by Jack. Michael breaks his bonds and goes after Bliss as well. The other performers are now also being inspired, leading Bliss to begin losing power. Eventually, Jack and Michael manage to drive Bliss back into hell. Afterwards, the performers find refuge with a nearby farmer who is willing to let them live on his property rent-free, while Michael winds up moving in with Ted Knight in an attempt to figure out how he wound up with Bliss to begin with. Over the next few nights, Jack takes on a few more costume thugs and then returns to his father's new home. Ted 
still takes Jack to task over not wearing the costume. In particular, the shirt that Jack has chosen to wear with a picture of the rag doll on it. Ragdoll is the alias of Peter Merkel, a former contortionist turned cat burglar. Merkel was able to use his ultra-flexible body to work his way into the most secure of areas. However, Ted Knight has a much greater reason to fear Ragdoll. In the not-too-distant past, Arthritis was slowly robbing the Ragdoll of his contortionist abilities, so he tried to change things up and became the leader of a murderous cult. As his followers grew, the Ragdoll decided to implement his master plan. He kidnapped the twin dollars of Opal City's leading banker, the ransom being that the Ragdoll would have full access to the bank vault within 24 hours, or his daughters would die. The second tier of the plan involved the Ragdoll's followers marching on a veteran's home on the outskirts of Opal City. This was enough for Ted to call in his fellow JSA members, The Flash, Jay Garrick, Green Lantern, Alan Scott, Our Man, Rex Tyler, and Dr. Midnight, Charles McKnighter. Midnight and Our Man went to protect the veteran's home, while the others tracked down the Ragdoll's location. Ted, Jay, and Alan made quick work of the Ragdoll's forces and tied the villain up. The Ragdoll was unfazed, though, and pointed out that his disciples were all over the world. He could easily target Ted's wife and children, Jay's wife, or the employees of Alan Scott's TV station. Ragdoll then wriggled free and tried to escape, only for Ted to fatally blast him with the cosmic rod. A few days later, Ragdoll's corpse was stolen from the Orpal City morgue. Returning to the present, Jack says he understands why Ted did what he did, especially after Jack killed Kyle. Jack also pointed out that if anyone came after Ted, he'd break the no-killing vow in a second. Meanwhile, Nash escapes from the Opal County Jail, and she then begins to implement her plan for revenge. The Shade drops by Jack's place and delivers some news. Jack initially thought it was about Nash, but it isn't. The immortal that Oscar Wilde spoke of in the Shade's journal back in 1882 it turns out that Wilde took inspiration for the man and turned it into the picture of Dorian Gray. The difference is, instead of a picture that reflected the immortal's true self, the immortal carries a special portal that comes in the form of a poster and absorbs the souls of individuals who look into it. The Shade is leaving Opal for a while in order to gather more information on this immortal, named Merritt, but tells Jack to keep his eyes open. After the Shade leaves, Jack receives a call from Jenny Scott, the daughter of Alan Scott, and the heroine in her own right named Jade. A long-time foe has been seen heading in the direction of Opal City. Jack heads down into the sewers to track down this monster. Jack needs to confront Solomon Grundy. Cyrus Gold was a merchant, or mobster depending on what you read, who was murdered by his partners and left in a swamp outside of Gotham City. Fifty years later, he emerged as a super-strong, wineless walking corpse. Gold adopted the name Solomon Grundy after a nursery rhyme, and he has lasted generations thanks to being virtually indestructible and being able to resurrect himself multiple times. Jack tussles with Grundy until a point where he blasts the undead monster with the cosmic rod. This injures Grundy to the point that Grundy actually starts crying. It's then that Jack realizes that Grundy meant no harm. He was living in the sewers out of fear. Jack offers to take Grundy back home and have him stay with Ted and Michael. Elsewhere, Nash makes her way to one of her father's numerous hideouts in Opal City. There, she sets about recreating her father's experiment, transforming herself into the new mist in the process. A few days later, Jack and Ted exit the Opal Courthouse, and Jack has been exonerated in Kyle's death, though he still feels conflicted about it. Ted assures Jack that people understand why he did what he did, and that he did what he needed to do. Back at the Knight Estate, Michael and Grundy begin to bond over their shared feelings of isolation. Ted and Jack return and begin racking up a game of pool when Ted notices that Michael and Grundy are missing. The two knights search the grounds only to turn up nothing. Jack grabs the cosmic rod and takes off to continue the search. Jack spends a couple of hours searching and just as he's about to go home he gets jumped and knocked unconscious. When Jack comes to, Jack finds himself naked with a barely clothed Nash standing over him. In case you are wondering, yes, they had sex, though Jack was not a willing participant. And this pays off in a later storyline. Jack wants to know what's going on. Nash tells Jack that she's testing him, and to regain his stuff, he'll have to run a gauntlet of her thugs in order to earn them back piece by piece. She then leaves Jack to begin his run. Back with Ted, Jack's absence has worried him to the point that he files a police report with one of the O'Dares. This gets interrupted by news of Mason O'Dair getting wounded in a shootout with two of the Mist's operatives. Ted returns home only to be attacked by another Mist employee, Dr. Phosphorus. Alex Sartorius was near a cracked nuclear reactor core that wound up having millions of particles of irradiated sand blasted into his body. This turned him into the living embodiment of the element phosphorus. 
Dr. Phosphorus's skin burns everything that comes into contact with it, even clothing. Back with Jack, he's made his way through a few of the thugs and regained some of his clothing. It's then that he comes across a room with a phone in it and tries to call his father. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Phosphorus answers and said that Ted's dead. Except Ted's really alive, and he manages to lure Phosphorus into a generator room. There, Ted douses the burning man, especially developed coolant, and knocks him out. Meanwhile, the O'Dares and the Opal City PD have their hands full with the Mist's minions. That is, until they receive some unexpected help from the Shade. Later, the Shade explains that he has a special need for the police family and tells them of the horrors to expect in the future. Meanwhile, it also turns out that the Mist had taken Michael and Grundy hostage. The two are being held on the top floor of one of Opal City's tallest buildings. There, they are beaten mercilessly, with Grundy being doused in alcohol. Michael begins to retaliate by activating his chest crystal, and it causes the building to explode. Back with Jack, who still believes his father is dead, he makes his way through more of the thugs and regains even more of his clothing. Eventually, he reaches the room containing his jacket and the cosmic rod. It's then that Nash appears. Nash tells Jack that Ted is really still alive and that she's going to let him go. She then gives Jack an offer, keeps striving to be the best Starman that he could be, and she'll leave the Knights alone, that is, until the time is right, and she's the best Miss that she can be. Nash tells Jack she'll see him later, and fades away. Afterwards, Nash leaves town while wearing a disguise. Michael and Grundy's still living bodies are pulled from the wreckage of the building rubble. The O'Dares meet with the Shade, and Starman prepares to go out once more. And that ends Volume 1 of the Starman Omnibus. How was it? Well, there's a really strong story here with a unique tale on the old hero's journey with really great artwork. Uh, in particular, I really like the fact that the one-issue stories really don't feel like filler. They seem to add to the mythos. Uh, that being said, I do have a couple of problems. Uh, first one's a minor nitpick. Um, Tony Harris's artwork on Oscar Wilde just looks a little too rotund from most pictures I've seen of Oscar Wilde. Also, uh, the last story arc uh, with the uh, Mist, a.k.a. Nash, implementing her big grand plan, uh, it's told from different perspectives, which means we get to see a lot of the same scenes over and over and over again, and it's just really repetitive and kind of grinds this to a bit of a halt. But those are kind of minor quibbles. They don't detract the fact that this is actually a pretty darn good book. I'm going to give Volume 1 of the Starman Omnibus a B. Hey guys, due to the fact that I couldn't shoot a video segment to select the next episode of the Random Trade Review, I decided to leave the decision up to you guys. That's right, you guys. Just go to my blog at sleepytimeforcatproductions.blogspot.com or click the link in the description below. There, you'll find a poll containing six titles that I already own. Two Marvel titles, two DC titles, and two independent titles. The titles you can choose from are Conan, the Frost Giant's Daughter, the Essential Moon Knight, Volume 1. Green Arrow, Sounds of Violence. Volume 1 of the manga, Missions of Love. The Possessed. Or Uncanny Avengers, Volume 1, The Red Shadow. The top three vote-getters will be Episodes 51, 52, and 53 of the Random Trade Review, respectively. Now, you don't have to vote for all three categories. If you want to vote for both Marvel titles, you can vote for both Marvel titles. There's nothing wrong with that. Thanks for your time, and I look forward to seeing what your results are.